Welcome to this video on septorhinoplasty. Before we begin, consider the following questions. What are the key questions to ask before undertaking septorhinoplasty surgery? What are the key aspects of clinical examination when assessing a patient for septorhinoplasty? What are the common causes of a saddle nose deformity? The history. The first question to ask the patient is what bothers them about their nose. Is it the shape? Is it the function? Is it a combination of both? Specifically to the function, ask the patient whether the blockage is unilateral, bilateral, or is it alternating in nature? When referring to the shape, ask the patient what bothers them specifically. Is it the hump? Is it their nasal tip? Is it the asymmetry of their nose or their nostrils? Or something else. In addition, it is important to ask the patient if they have any other symptoms of rhinologic disease, such as a change in their sense of smell, any nosebleeds, any anterior or posterior rhinorrhea, sneezing, and symptoms of nasal allergy. With regards to the past medical history, ask about a history of any previous surgery or trauma to the nose. Does the patient have any asthma, hay fever, or atopy? Is there any history of body dysmorphia or any other psychiatric conditions? Are there any drug allergies, specifically non-steroidals? And in the social history, ask about cocaine use, alcohol and smoking. Clinical examination. This comprises two parts, an external and an internal nasal examination. For the external portion, Examine the nose in thirds, the upper, middle, and lower thirds, then in relation to the rest of the face. The upper one third is bony, the mid third is cartilaginous and made up of the dorsal septum and upper lateral cartilages, and it may have a hump or be twisted. The lower third is also called the nasal tip and comprises the lower lateral cartilages, the columella, the fibro fatty tissue, and the nostrils. Comment externally on the skin thickness, the tip recoil by palpating the nose to assess support. Various angles exist, but for the purposes of the exam, the key ones to note are the nasofrontal angles and the nasolabial angles. Comment on whether the tip is droopy in nature or totic, and whether the nose is over-rotated or under-rotated, over or under-projected. Comment on no nostril asymmetry and comment on the shape of the tip. Ideal textbook proportions refer to the base of the nose as being an equilateral triangle between the tip and ala bases. The columella to lobule ratio should be approximately two thirds to one third and look closely here for columella scars. The internal or the endonasal examination comprises anterior rhinoscopy to examine the caudal septum, the inferior turbinates and the state of the nasal mucosa. Often nasal endoscopy is not as effective for assessing the base of the nose. Look carefully at the internal nasal valve. This is the cross-sectional area between the nasal septum, the upper lateral cartilages, and the head of the inferior turbinate. Carry out a modified Cottle's maneuver here by using a Jobson horn probe to gently move the upper lateral cartilages to see if the airflow improves. Note that the ideal angle between the upper lateral cartilages and septum should be approximately 10 to 15 degrees. Next, flexible or rigid nasal endoscopy can be carried out using a three-pass technique to exclude masses, posterior deviations, and septal perforations, particularly important if patients have undergone previous nasal surgery. Following the history and examination, Ideally, clinical photography is carried out as per the IMI or Institute of Medical Illustrator guidelines. And here, six key views are required as a minimum. Frontal view, basal view, left and right lateral views in the Frankfurt plane, and left and right oblique views. Additional optional views include a helicopter view, a smiling view, and views on forced inspiration. What are the common causes of a saddle nose deformity? A saddle nose is otherwise referred to as a supratip depression. 
For the majority of patients, this is an acquired condition and is characterized by the loss of dorsal height. To some less experienced colleagues, a milder saddle nose can often be mistaken for a dorsal hump, so it is important to look at the position of the radix and the nasal tip and the height of the dorsal septum first. It is worth noting that in some races and in some families, there is a degree of dorsal depression. Various classification schemes have been used, but none widely accepted. One commonly used one by Rollin Daniel in 2006 divided a saddle nose deformity into four subtypes. Type 1 has a supratip depression with columella retraction. Type 2 is more advanced with loss of tip projection and septal support. Type 3 has loss of total cartilage vault integrity with flattening of the nasal lobule and type 4 shows progression with involvement of the bony vault. The commonest causes of a saddle nose deformity are traumatic and iatrogenic. In traumatic cases, it is commonly seen in patients who have had multiple nasal traumas such as boxes. In these cases, there may be direct disruption of septal support or they may have had an unrecognized septal hematoma which in turn can lead to irreversible cartilage resorption. In iatrogenic cases, this is typically seen in patients who have had old-fashioned septoplasty surgery with significant resection of the quadrilateral cartilages. In addition, in rhinoplasty patients who have had dorsal dehumping, they too can have a saddle nose deformity. Various medical causes can also cause a saddle nose deformity, and these include GPA, relapsing polychondritis, leprosy or Hansen disease, syphilis, and ectodermal dysplasia. It is worth noting that cocaine is also a very common cause of a septal perforation, which in turn can lead to a saddle nose deformity. I hope you found this video to be useful. Please consider subscribing and let us know what you'd like us to cover next.